Catch the Fire TV is free for everyone all over the world. If you've been impacted by God through these videos, please consider giving towards this project. Your gift will help us keep improving and creating new content to bless and transform more lives. You can give by clicking on the icon and selecting Catch the Fire TV in the drop down. And what I want to talk to you tonight about is, is the, the, the stages of life that take us to different levels of awareness that begin to form, supplement, and align our whole worldview. And um, then we want to have some earth-shaking Holy Ghost encounters that will do just that in your heart. How many want one of those? Okay, Romans 8, 28 to about 32. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And you could turn that one around and say, if God is for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. And a lot of times we read that passage because there's something going on in our life that's, you know, upsetting or difficult or whatever, we're going through stuff. But I want us to see this passage now over the span of your lifetime. How many of you are planning to live your lifetime? <laughs> it may be short, it may be long, but you're gonna live the whole lifetime, yeah? Somebody said it like this, life happens. And when God is in the picture, it's, it's gonna make everything different. Life happens around us uh, and we become more and more aware of people, places, things, beliefs, cultures, and all of that, that starts to affect us. And when we get immersed in the word of God and immersed in the, in the plan of heaven, you know, it, it puts edges on us where I think it propels us into the three journeys that I'm often talking about. First of all, there's the inward journey, that's for you. There's the upward journey, that's for him. And the outward journey, that's for others, for them, that's your ministry. So the inward journey is for you to receive all the good stuff and expel all the bad stuff. The upward journey is for you to learn to love him, to pray to him, to worship him and honor him. And by the way, wasn't that worship tonight just fantastic? Oh, gosh. Ben, don't go too far away. We're going to have to sing that blow mighty breath of God again before we're done tonight. But then the outward journey is very, very important because it's you and I taking the good news of the kingdom to a broken, hurting world. Now, see... A broken, hurting world cannot receive good news from broken, hurting people. That's why we need to get on those three journeys. But let me come back to uh, this awareness thought. Awareness is something that grows and expands. Now, you probably won't remember this part, but from zero to two, there's a growing awareness in, in infants and children about who their mother is, who their father is, and a bit of their home surroundings. And, and most people don't remember that young back. I think, Steve, you remember um, at a very young age, like more than most people. I mean, you, you got three-year-old recollections and stuff. Yeah. When you get three to five, 
it broadens out family, friends, neighbors, um, grocery store maybe, church, family. It just starts to broaden five to 12. Now we got school, now we got neighborhood, now we got our town or city, things like bicycles, books, gadgets, and hopefully a growing awareness of God. How many here were blessed to have uh, Christian parents or at least parents that were Christian enough to tell them about God? Wave at me and give, give a big thanks to mom or dad or both or whoever had a hand in that. Hopefully there's a growing awareness in God. And when we get into 13 to 19, we begin to realize that we are not a, an extension of our parents, but we're actually an individual in our own right. And we begin to individuate, as they say, we want our own lives, don't we? And we begin to get plans and desires of our own and our own ambitions. And we become aware of the opposite sex. You remember that? I can remember seven or eight uh, thinking, girls, why would we want to be bothered with girls? You know, da 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 da. I'm, my parents had a good laugh about that, and they were like, one day you will change your mind. No, I won't. No, I won't. Well, they were right, weren't they, Carol? <laughs> and we begin to think about our lives in long term, about our career. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be a lawyer? Do you want to be a teacher? Do you want to be a nurse? Do you want to be a policeman? What do you want to do? <laughs> How many wanted to be a policeman when you were a little boy or girl? Or a fireman? You know, they had all the fun driving those big red trucks. Then we begin to think, well, marriage, etc. And our thoughts and our opinions uh, of what's going on around us begin to form and it becomes our take on the world around us. And this is what we call our world view. It's our concept of reality and how we think things ought to be and how we, we think people ought to behave and, and it, it affects uh, a lot of stuff and it's composed of your family environment and what you've learned, what you've learned in school, etc., and your life experiences. It can affect your politics, your religion, your mor morality. It affects whether you believe in creation or evolution. And it answers the questions, who am I? Why am I here and where am I going? But you know what, we need answers to those basic questions. And I don't think there are any answers apart from um, what heaven is gonna to bring to you and declare to you that uh, who are you? You're, you are a, an individual precious and created in the image and likeness of God. And uh, just while I'm on it, you did not just happen out of a, a slime pit somewhere <laughs> over millions of years. You were planned uh, down to the finest detail and made in the image and likeness of God as was every other created thing. I think DNA and uh, the whole genome thing has really nailed that one, but just in case you got convinced about evolution, just turn to somebody and say, that's not what happened. You were created in the image and likeness of God. And that goes for all of you watching at home. Why am I here? Why would God create you? He created you to get to know him, to love him and serve him. And see, there's, there's this amazing thing about love where you can't pre-program it. It has to be a voluntary response. Imagine if I commanded Carol every morning, you will love me today or else. 
<clears throat> now it's possible I could frighten her enough to, to, to sort of keep her within certain boundaries of behavior. But that wouldn't be love, would it? Would it? No, no because see, love has to be a, a voluntary response that comes from the heart of one person to another. Now, why is God like that? Why is he called love? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it makes so much sense to me that God must be a plurality. If God is love, he can't just be a singularity. There has to be more than one. And as it turns out, there's three in one. So he's perfect love contained in among himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think it was Augustine who, who, who said the Father is the lover, Jesus is the beloved, and the Holy Spirit is the love that flows between him. And, and it's a mystery, and it, but it's amazing. God is love. And so if he's going to make someone in his own image, then love is going to be at the center of the thing and love is going to be at the bottom of the thing. So why are you here? Because he wants to tease it out of you, a willingness to see him for who he really is and begin to love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and mind. Love him. Why? Because see, that, that's, that's the whole purpose of the deal. This is the divine romance. This is the great um, love affair of the ages that's going on all around us. See, it's not about your performance. It's not about you looking good. It's not about you getting straight A's on an exam or whatever. The question is, did you know and learn how to love? How many get this? Wave excitedly. You know, the reason why the guys in Haiti said I went to seminary and, and studied religion and, and, and theology for all these years, and I never heard any of this stuff. See, that's the tragedy because really, friends, it's all about uh, getting a grip on the, love of, on the love of God. So who am I? Why am I here? Where are we going? Where's this thing going? Do you know the Bible begins with a wedding, Adam and Eve? It ends with a wedding, you and Jesus. Woohoo! Hee ha! Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And so, what he wants to do is through your healed up heart, reach out and bring in a whole bunch of other people who can similarly get their hearts healed up and get going on this amazing journey of love and life because it's going to last for eternity. And you know, I was thinking about that one day and I thought, if it was the way I used to think it was, that is the fear of the Lord held people on the straight and narrow forever. I realized that that wouldn't have worked for me. I might have conformed for the first million years because hell is pretty terrible. But I would have got to the point eventually where I said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. Go ahead, burn me, fry me, whatever, but I just can't toe the line anymore. But when I realized that if we step over into this divine romance where there's this ever increasing wonder and appreciation of who he is and how wonderful he really is and the incredible depths of his love. I figured now I've got something that will keep me forever right there. See, that's, that's where we're going. And as these things begin to unfold, it affects our worldview, our concept of reality. Does your expanding worldview include the Trinity? 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when you talk to people, um, this is something that's really helpful just to see where's their worldview at? Is God even a part of it? And if not, then it's your pleasure to introduce him to those people supernaturally. Now, something else that really has an effect on our worldview is the progression that you and I go through in the stages of life. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this. Okay, you go to school, that's one. Then you graduate from, from uh, public school, you go into high school, and, and okay, then into college and so on. And graduation is something that expands your worldview. And you begin thinking about your career, your adulthood, uh, I'm, are you going to get married? Okay, you get married and then your children. And every time something like that happens, this gives you a whole different take on life, isn't it? How many remember when you had your, your first children, you brought them home? And you thought, oh my gosh, what have we done? <laughs> Then your children start getting married and they present you with grandchildren and your worldview just got bigger. And grandchildren are a really good deal because you can spoil them and then hand them back. <laughs> and then there's a, a stage where there's like the death of your parents. And you're like, whoa. Carol and I were up at up my mother's cottage and the police drove in one day and just informed me that my father had just died because we had no phone and there were no cell phones in those days and all that. And, and we're like, oh my gosh, it seems like it's so, it's so final, yeah? And uh, then a little while later, it was, it was actually... Um, in, in the fall of 1986, when my mother died, just in the hospital up here. And uh, it, was, it was a quick thing. I mean, she, she found out she had liver cancer, and boom, a month later she was gone. And yet, in, in that room, we were with her a lot of that time, and one day she just kind of recovered a little bit and said, look at all the angels. And we're like, what? What, mom? Look at all the angels. And I'm like, where, where, you know. <laughs> but there was the, the curtain, the veil between this life and that life was beginning to draw back. And it wasn't long before she breathed her last. And I, I remember thinking, my gosh, it, what a long, long breath she breathed out. I don't know if you've ever been with someone when they died, but it just seemed like a, a breath that was three or four times longer than normal, and then, then she's gone. And so what, what's different here? The, the body's there, but, but the person, you know, they're not there now. And you begin to be confronted with, with things like death, and that will expand your worldview some more. And uh, you begin to get an awareness of your aging. I can remember my dad saying, life is short, son. I'm thinking, yeah, maybe for you. <laughs> but I've got my whole life ahead of me. And then when you, when you turn 50, you start to realize, whoa, 50, how did I get here? Anybody here turn 50 this year? Give me a wave. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's an achievement, actually. Because not everybody makes it. But uh, you realize my dad was right. Life is short. And then there's 60. And then there's 65. You know, when I was 65, we gave the church over to Steve and Sandra, because I figured that was, that was right, you know. He, he, they were with us, served us faithfully all these years. And it was just very fitting and right that we would turn it over to a spiritual son and daughter. 
and it increased our worldview because you go through this thing of, okay, now what will I do? Well, I just sort of moved up a notch and got uh, busy with Partners of Harvest and, all, and church planting and all the things that we, we've been doing. And, and, you know, it's in the kingdom, you don't have to worry about what are you going to do. The, the worry is, what can I cut out doing? <laughs> and so, um, here they go. 50, 60, 70. How did I get here? I can remember being 65 thinking, well, it's not all bad because now the government is going to start paying me. <laughs> Uh, and so they have been for like 11 years now, Carol. You, you know, we get, we get a couple of grand a month from them. Isn't that good? I mean, fortunately, we have more than that to live on. But anyway, it's good. And we think about retirement, and it expands our worldview a little bit. And you know what? That's usually about as far as it goes. Because most of us don't want to think about death. It's like, John, don't go there. Come on, this is a conference. We want the Holy Spirit and fire and everything. No, listen. <clears throat> Your death is a certainty unless the coming of Jesus preempts it. Can you handle that? And so what you need to do is realize that death has no more power over you. And for that, you're going to need a paradigm shift and you're going to need a divine encounter with the living God to tell your heart uh, the truth about these things. And, and people say, John, how old, how old are you now? I'm like, I'm, I'm 76. They say, 76? You don't look 76. And I said, well, what are you saying? That 76 is old? Oh, no, 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 I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm so sorry if you say that, I mean, it's old. But how old is old when you're gonna live forever? Right? And so it's important, and that's why it is important to have dramatic encounters with the things of God to help bring us into alignment with the truth of his kingdom and the kingdom of heaven and the word of God and not try to reconcile the, the fad of the age with, that's basically cruising on a youth cult in a sense and everybody's trying to stay forever young. And, and I'm not against that. I mean, Carol dresses young and I like that. <laughs> But I'm just saying, you gotta, you gotta be realistic about it too because you can't have your worldview rooted in a delusion. It's gotta be rooted and grounded in truth and in the love of God. Why? Because this whole thing is going somewhere and it's going somewhere fast. Tell somebody you're gonna live forever. I want you to realize that contrary to what's a lot of public opinion, um, there is such a thing as absolute truth, absolute moral standards, absolute right and wrong. Someone said, I don't believe in absolutes. And the guy said, are you absolutely sure about that? <laughs> Tell him again, you're gonna live forever. Now these encounters that we have, yeah, come on a bit. They, the, these um, mitigate the impact that all the stuff all around you in the world and on television and the movies and, and in the news and in the 
in the, you know, the info that's coming from this culture and that culture, the truth will resonate with you in your spirit. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now listen, I'm saying all that because we are on the very edge of the greatest revival the world has ever seen. I don't know how long it's gonna last. It, it might be a year, it might be two years, it might be 10 years, I don't know. But I don't think it's gonna be long, long. I think it's gonna be so fast and so powerful that it's, it, the world is gonna get changed like really, really quick. But I want us to begin to think about what shifts the culture. Now, how many know that our culture and our cultural worldview is in serious trouble? They believed lie after lie after lie, and none of it gives, gives really a lot of hope. But what you and I carry is going to change the destiny of millions of people for years and years, in fact, for eternity to come. Now, we just did something that was kind of fun back in August. Uh, Jeremy and Connie, I don't think you're here tonight, right? Maybe you're watching at home. But Jeremy's birthday came up and Carol and I were aware of uh, these Enchroma glasses. Now, Enchroma glasses help colorblind people to see colors. And they really do. I don't know how they do it, but it does something with the light and this and that. And so we, we had Jeremy come over to his brother-in-law's house and Jerry Steingart. And, uh, and we had a sort of an early birthday party for him because we weren't gonna be around. And, and so then we brought out these, these glasses all wrapped up, you know, and, and he opened this gift and that gift. And then he got to this one and he goes, oh no, is, is this what I think this is? And, and so he took them out and, and he put them on for the first time. And there was, uh, he, was he was silent. Now, Carol, uh, it's bothered her for years that Jeremy was colorblind. Really bothered me. She can't imagine a world without color, right? And so tell us your impression. Oh my gosh, because like you said, it really, really bothered me that he couldn't see color. You know, I'd say, Jeremy, what color is that? And he would say, well, I think it's like a gray. And I would go, oh, Jeremy, really? And, and so I said, Lord, I want to be in heaven when Jeremy gets to heaven because I want to be there when he sees color. And so I got the privilege of being there when he put these glasses on. And his, he just couldn't believe it. He just, he just looked and he looked and he looked and then he took them off and he put them back on again. And he looked and he said, is that what you see all the time? And we went, what do you see, Jeremy? He said, the greens, they're green. It's not brown, it's green. Is that green, he said. Yeah, oh, he said, there's that green. And we said, yeah, that's green, Jeremy. And the grass was brown to him. The leaves on the trees were the same color as the trunk. And it was just like, he was just, he was going, he said, there's different, uh, different um, colors of green. And, and yeah, there's a light one and there's a dark one. And, and, and then we had all these different color balloons. We brought out these different color balloons and, and, and we said, Jeremy, what color is, he knew, he knew a couple of them, but he said, I don't know what that is. What's that? That's red, Jeremy. Oh my gosh, is that red? And he takes his glasses off and he looks and he goes, oh, that's red, that's really red. Wow, that's really neat. And then he got to the purple one and he said, is that blue? And we said, no, Jeremy, that's purple. He said, purple, really? Oh my gosh, and he just, he just went 
oh, it was just the most unbelievable, incredible. I think I got about as blessed as he did. Because it was really incredible. And we took him down along the river, and, and so there was different flowers and stuff. And, and so I was teaching him the different shades of colors, because he didn't know that either. And he didn't know what lavender was, or periwinkle was, or uh, burgundy was, or what, you know. And it's just like, and I'm such a color gal uh, that it yeah. was just. It was just so over the moon, but his paradigm got totally shifted that day. Woo! And I think that ours is going to be shifted too. When now that's what we happen. call a paradigm shift. Yeah. Imagine going from a gray brown world to living color. And he couldn't get over it. It was like the green, especially the greens. Green. He just the couldn't get over the really green. Got but the reds and the purple and the this and the that. We got him a little children's book yeah. that was different birds. You know, the cardinal's red and the bluebird is blue and the, yeah. and, uh, the, the parrot Oreo. is green and the, the Oriole's Oreo. orange. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. that kind of stuff. And he's like, wow. And, and it was just uh, took him to a whole other place. It was so cool. Now, see... God has these things arranged for you and I, where he wants you and I to have a major paradigm shift that take you into a whole new dimension. I just looked it up and watched it today, and it was the story of Dr. Mary Neal, who is an orthopedic surgeon. And a few years ago, I think it was 2002 or something like that, uh, her and her husband went on a trip for, for their anniversary, or his birthday, one of them, down to Chile into Whitewater there where they would kayak and run these rapids and go over these falls and everything. And they were really good at it, and so that's what they were doing. And this one day, uh, as she went over this falls, the, her kayak, got stuck in rocks below and the rushing water just folded her right over the top of her boat and she, she was held underwater for something like 20, 25 minutes. And what happened is her spirit came out of her body. Now, she was a sort of believer, I suppose a lukewarm Christian she went to church because she wanted her children to grow up with morals and values and things like that. And all of a sudden, she came out of her body and she tells this amazing story about how these angels and people met her and they were so welcoming and so friendly and this and that. And they took her to a beautiful pathway and a, and a garden and came up to this sort of like a beautiful dome building and she said, I, I knew it was the point of no return. And it was kind of like, do you want to go through there? And she's like, yes, I do. And there was such a sense of well-being on her. It was like, oh, my children will be okay. My family will be okay. If this is where we're coming to, everything will be okay. Yes. And then it, she was told, actually, it's not your time. If it's all right with you, you're going to go back into your body. And miraculously, she broke loose and, and they got her and did uh, CPR and, and, and she revived. The Lord brought her back into her body. She was flown home where she underwent all kinds of medical treatment for broken legs and this and that. But this, this experience that she had was like an absolute paradigm shift that totally altered her worldview. And she wrote a book about it uh, that was called To Heaven and Back or something like that. How many would like to go to heaven and back? How many want to go to heaven tonight? Mm. <laughs> She was jammed underwater for 40 minutes, then came out of her body and saw visions of angels, glory, beauty, and didn't want to leave, and then was told it's not her time. 
It was a massive paradigm shift. And what did it do for her? She realized as someone who was centered around her career, her family, her community, and everything, that heaven is very, very real, and there is life after this life. Major paradigm shift. And she said that since that time, she's met over a thousand people that have had a similar experience. And she said, without exception, every one of them no longer has a fear of death. Ian McCormick said the same thing. Remember, we had him here, some of you may remember. And uh, friends, what this is doing, the Lord is pulling back the, the curtain on some of this stuff to remind us that the deal is not so much about this life as important as it is, but this is really formative so that you can be prepared for that which is coming. And he wants your heart and your whole worldview to begin to be pulled into line and sync with the worldview of heaven and the revelation that really is all in heaven. How many want your uh, cultural understanding of everything to line up with the culture of heaven? Do you? Wave excitedly, tell heaven, yes. Okay, now let me just tell you this. If, if, if it's out of sync a bit, I oh know this is heaven and this is you, guess which one is gonna have to move? How many think heaven's gonna move and accommodate me? Heaven's gonna take me on my terms. No, absolute, remember, absolute. He's going to lovingly nudge you over more and more until you and I come into sync with the culture of heaven and that whole worldview. Now, as I thought about it, there's four major areas of life-giving spiritual encounters that will shift your spiritual paradigm. Number one is salvation. Bible's very clear on this. You must be born again. And I've said this many times, but John Wesley was asked years ago, Mr. Wesley, why is it everywhere you go, you speak on the subject, you must be born again? And he said, well, it's because you must be born again. <laughs> so if you, wanna, if you wanna get in on this thing that we're talking about, you must be born again. What's that mean? You need to realize that you're not complete in yourself. There's things that have separated us from God, sin and your self-will and your own way and your ungodly beliefs and this and that and the other. And you need to have that debt paid off by Jesus himself who comes and, and satisfies the, the perfect one by, by paying your debt with his own life. So the innocent, perfect one dies for the guilty, you and I, so the guilty can go free. I'll never forget the day I was born again. Downtown Toronto Exhibition Park, Billy Graham meeting, dragged there the first night, made it through, intact, I thought. And then they wanted to go again. The second night, uh, and you know your mother says, I really want you to go. And when they give you that look and put it that way, you know, you kind of think, okay, if you know what's good for you, you will go to this. I went and I am so thankful I did because see, my grandfather leaned over to me at the very end during the, during the, in, the intense part of the altar call was starting to lift. And he said to me, John, if you're not sure, you better go. And that cut through my stubbornness and set me free, boom. And I just bolted for the altar, knocking chairs out of the way and all that kind of stuff. I think I was the last guy of an altar call of about 2,000 people. 
and I got born again. And I'm telling you, the next day I remember the sky's more blue, the grass is more green. Like I, I had those and chroma glasses on, you know, I was just like, wow, what's happened? Everybody that I met was a wonderful person. <laughs> Incredible. Paradigm shift. It impacted my limited world view as a 15 year old. Amazing. The next one is healing, when supernatural healings happen. The sequence for me was the third one, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Like Steve, I grew up Baptist. And um, my parents thought, my mother at least, Pentecostals, they swing from the chandeliers and they, and they roll around all over the floor and they, they do a lot of stuff like you guys do. <laughs> and, uh, but I found out from them that there was more. And they were talking about the Holy Spirit and they were talking about miracles as though they believed the Bible could happen today. And I was really interested in that. And so I found out about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they believed you had to, you had to tarry for him. You had to wait and pray and seek him, which is not all bad at all. But one night it happened to me in the middle of a dream it was like a volcano went off inside of me and I just well, awoke speaking in tongues. And it was powerful. And I realized the Holy Spirit is real. It's not like repeat after me, jump in a Honda or something. <laughs> it's, it was amazing. Yeah. And Wow, all of a sudden, it's like those glasses again. I can, I can, the Holy Spirit's real. The Bible's true. Don't you get it? The Bible's really true. And you know, people are, they're a bit wild-eyed in that state. And, and then I found out that healing happens today. I can remember, got a Catherine Kuhlman book from the library and read about it and there was all these miracles. And I thought, wow. I mean, our church talked about it a little bit, but I never ever saw one. I always saw a big hoo-ha when they're praying for somebody who was sick, but I don't think I ever saw a miracle. And uh, then one day we had a guy come and you know what, when he'd pray for them, people would fall over. I was like, my gosh, that's amazing. And then uh, our daughter, Lori, as a, as a child had terrible eczema. And she got prayer one day, and you know that eczema got healed up. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is good. And I can remember making a trip to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Where's our Pennsylvania people? Uh -huh. And um, there's supposed to be miracles going on there, according to that book. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go down there, and I'm like, oh, God, I hope I can, please, can I just see one healing, one miracle. And when we got there, it blew me away because there was already a queue, a lineup, wanting to get in the, in the church. And they opened the doors and everybody ran, you know. And, and so there we are. And the next thing you know, she came out, preached a little bit, miracles started happening. And you know, there's like a hundred miracles and, and you couldn't keep track of them all. People with heart conditions and cripples and wheelchairs, this, that, and the other. I mean, it was just mind-blowing that people get those kind of healings. And then you start to get them, you say, wow, that was great, but I'd really like to see somebody I know get a healing. Then you see that and it's like, wow. And then I'd like a healing myself. And when you get your first healing, how many have had at least one? Wave excitedly, thank you, Lord, okay. Remember how mind-blowing it is when you get that healing. Now see, that's why people like Amy Sample McPherson and the Jeffries brothers, they had what they called a four-square gospel that had four main points that they preached on most of the time. Salvation, healing, 
baptism in the Holy Spirit and the second coming of Christ. And see, those first three will set you up in terms of your worldview being in line with heaven to prepare you for the fourth one. How many want the fourth one? See, the fourth one goes like this. Uh, the coming of the Lord, um, unless, of course, you die first. And then that's the coming of the Lord for you at that moment, isn't it? How many are looking forward to that? Dying, I mean. <laughs> I want you to be. I really, really do. I mean, it's hard on the family, but see... The first three will help you prepare for the fourth one, and that's the biggie. That's what the testing of life is all about. What's happening? Your worldview is being brought into line with that of heaven. These are often the missing pieces that will help you understand what the heck is going on. And that the plan of God is actually going somewhere. So, that's why we want you to begin to experience the power of heaven in your life through salvation, healing, and Holy Spirit encounters. Now, someone said to Carol and I three or four years ago, are you, are you guys still on that come Holy Spirit stuff? Because, you know, we, we were at a at a place where there was a church, new church opening and it was being dedicated. I think I was one of the speakers and this and that. And uh, Carol was, was being mischievous a little and praying for people and, 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 they, and they, they didn't want any part of it. These were people that had been touched but were like, you know what? We did that back in the day but kind of moved on. Are you guys still doing that? Now see, don't ever move on from Holy Spirit encounters. And it's salvation, it's healing, it's baptism and encounters of the Holy Spirit because all of that prepares you for the fourth one that is inevitable. Either you will die and meet him, or you will meet him in the air. But you're going to meet him. And that, my friend, is the big event of your entire life and history thus far. He's gathering a family of people who love him. And oh my goodness. You know, I just read the other day where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He's saying, you must be born again. What? How can that be? Do you enter in your mother's womb? You're born a second time? And, and Jesus ended up saying to him, look, if I tell you of earthly things and you don't believe, what would you do if I told you about heavenly things? It's one of those tantalizing verses. He's saying to be born again is actually an earthly thing. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have said that. I would have put that in the heavenly category. But no, no, that's, that's an earthly thing compared to what's coming. Eye has not seen nor ear heard that, and neither has it even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And those things are revealed to us by the Spirit. So you don't have to wait till you die or till Jesus comes for those things to start to be revealed to you. There, there's just a whole realm out there. Remember what he said to, um, uh, I think it was Philip, the, the, when I, I saw you under the fig tree, De Nathaniel, thank you, in John chapter one. And, and Nathaniel's like, Whoa, you, you're, the, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Now Jesus is surprised by that. He said, you believe just because I said, I saw you under the fig tree. I saw you when you were praying. Who's the Messiah? Lord, show me. Will I see him? Da, da, da. Maybe there's something like that going on. But he said, you're going to see greater things than those. You're going to see angels 
uh, ascending and descending um, around the Son of Man. You're going to see that. How many would like to see stuff like that? that? This is all that's coming and about to break, and I think it's already started. So where do we begin? Our banner up here said, Revival Now. Can we begin now? How many are ready now? So what are we going to do? We're going to have salvation, healing, and spiritual Holy Spirit encounters to prepare us for number four. That's what we're going to do. How many need a healing in your body? Besides me, I could use a few. You can almost count the ones whose hands up. Let me ask it this way. Do we have any perfect specimens in the room with not a thing wrong with you? Okay, how many need a healing of some kind? You need more hair, less weight, uh, whatever. Let's stand and we're going to believe God. Very often when we begin to do healing meetings, I want to make sure that people understand two basic things. Number one, it's the will of God to heal you. Unless it's your time to die, it is the will of God to heal you. Number two, his time is now. Now, I'm saying it's the will of God to heal you. How do I know that? Where do you get that? I mean, there's books out there, 101 Reasons Why God Does Not Heal Today. I hope you don't read those books, but they're out there. Jesus healed everybody. Now, he didn't get up on a mountain and say, let everyone sick in the nation be healed right now. No, they had to exercise a little bit of faith and come to him. And that, what was their faith? They turned up at the meeting, wondering, I wonder if anything will happen to me. And he healed them all, whatever was wrong, big things, little things. I know it's the will of the Father to heal you because Jesus healed everybody and he never did one thing that was out of the will of God. So I want you to say to yourself, it's the will of God to heal me. Now the next thing is, his time is now. How do I know that? Because he's the great I am. Not the great I will be, though he will be. Not the great I was though he was, he's the great I am. And so when we look at what Jesus did, he always healed people then and there. He never said, come back in a year when you when you're sorted yourself out. No, it was like right then and there. And you know what? They weren't perfect people. The devil will tell you, well, you don't deserve to be healed. You're not going to be healed. You don't deserve to be healed. You don't read the Bible enough, you don't pray enough, you don't give enough, you don't care enough, you don't this or that or the other enough. And, and, and if we're not careful, we, we can be drawn into agreeing with him. I want you to break that agreement. Of course you don't deserve it. It's a free gift. And he just wants to give it to you. Do you know that that's what the whipping was all about? Jesus was whipped. You know, the, the Mel Gibson's movie on the Passion, that was not overdone. Isaiah said he was marred more than any man. They whipped him to oblivion. I mean, he was just a mess with that incredible whip. You know, when they made that movie, 
Um, I forget the actor's name, but Jim Cavazel. He, he had body armor on when they're, when they're whipping him, but, but the armor slipped one time and one of those, one of those flails came around and got him in the side. He said it hurt so bad he just about fainted right on the spot. Just one of them. That's what they did to our Savior. Why did the Father allow that whipping? You know, it wasn't let's just torture him while we're at it, you know, or let the Romans be extra cruel. Or no. no, no. Isaiah says it very clearly. He bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases, and by his stripes we are healed. See, he paid for your healing. And so we need to appropriate it. We said, well, if, do you believe healing's in the atonement? I believe everything's in the atonement. Well, then why am I not healed? I've had prayer a dozen times. Well, it's kind of like I believe everybody's supposed to be saved too. Why isn't everybody saved? There's reasons. That we, could, we could write 10 books on why people are not healed. There's things that can hinder, things in your life, things in the life of the ministers, just the whole load of stuff. But let's not go there. Let's just, like Bill Johnson said, let's focus on what God is doing, not what he's not doing. If you believe it's the will of God to heal you, raise your hand. Now let's just have childlike faith tonight. It is the will of God to heal you, and his time is now. All right. Now, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. And I love this in it when a large group like this where you can't get at people and pray for everyone. Um, I want you to realize the message of Jesus was this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said that over and over. John the Baptist said it, then Jesus said it, and Jesus demonstrated it. Then he takes the 12 and tells them to do the same thing. And part of the Holy Spirit sent them out to, to do five things. Tell people the kingdom is at hand or within reach. And then heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. And off they go. And then he takes 70 others and tells them the same thing. And off they go. And they start healing everywhere that they go. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is within your reach. Now listen carefully. There's no sickness in heaven. None. So if you've got pain in your hips, your back, your neck, your head, your whatever, if you've got conditions, blood condition, heart condition, liver condition, uh, whatever condition you have, it is not the will of God. I like what Sandra said last night. You know, your lung, some of you got lung conditions, problems with your breathing. It's not the will of God. Those lungs are for the breath of God to be in. He breathes the breath of life into you. And he wants those lungs pure and set us apart and holy unto him. It's a wonderful thing. So can we just be like five-year-olds for a moment? So that means you're not going to question one thing I say. You're just going to go happily along with it all. And you can analyze it tomorrow. How's that? <laughs> so, kids, listen. Just above your head, if you get up on your tiptoes, you can reach that kingdom that's within your reach. And I want you to, by faith, just put your hands in that invisible, powerful kingdom of God. Just right now. And just leave them up there for a while. Ben, this would be a real good time to do that. Just get your hands up there. And I realized that we've done this in the past, but I was doing it too quickly. Because we need to soak in this a little bit and just kind of get that glory all over us here. 
Oh yeah. Come on, Holy Spirit. We believe you for a supernatural impartation of your presence. Listen, I want you to realize that you need to put your faith somewhere. And I don't want your faith in your faith or your ability to believe or to do this or to do that. I want you to put your faith in the anointing, put your faith in this presence that's right there at the, at the end of your fingers. The kingdom of heaven is within your reach. Now I want you to take it. Just grab hold of it. Come on, children, grab it. Now let your hands be an extension of the hands of Jesus. And carefully bring that liquid golden honey, oily presence of the Holy Spirit down. And rub that into your need right now. Rub that into your heart condition. Rub that into your spine. Rub that into your hips. Rub it into your knees. Rub it into your eyes. Rub it into your ears. Your neck. Your migraine headaches. In the name of Jesus, I command pain to go from God's people now. In his mighty name. We are in you, Lord, and we make these declarations in you. Pain, go. Stiffness, go. Mobility, return. Disease, go. Lungs, breathe. Fire, come into them in Jesus' name. Lord, those watching at home, let fire go right through that computer of theirs right into their bodies right now. Lord, heal eyes. I just see floaties being erased right now. I see vision coming clear, coming sharp right here. I see ears opening in the name of Jesus. I tell those ears to open. I tell all that, that uh, noise to go right from your hearing right now in the name of Jesus. Though that arthritis in the hands just come out of them right now in the name of Jesus. Just enter into this song for just a verse or two. Blow mighty breath of God. Move among this place. Mighty breath of God. Put your faith into this anointing, friends, right here. Mighty breath of God. Come in power and grace. Stream of mercy flowing down light of heaven all around and it's falling to the
coming on us, Holy Spirit. I want you to intentionally ask the Lord who you need to forgive right now. Talk about why in a minute. People have hurt you through life. It has skewed your worldview. That men are horrible, women are horrible, this, that, or the other. No, you believed a lie. You've been sinned against, and the way out is for you to forgive. Say, Holy Spirit, who do I need to forgive right now? And just begin to do it. I forgive my mother, I forgive my father, I forgive my wife, my husband, my friend, my children, my parents, my this, that, or the other. Just quickly, just do it quickly. I choose to forgive, Lord. I give them a gift they do not deserve right now. In the name of Jesus, because I'm reaching for heaven in this place. I'm reaching for heaven. Oh, breath of God, begin to blow upon me, begin to move upon me. I want you to reach up one more time. Take a big handful of that kingdom. Now pull it down. Let your hands be an extension of the hands of Jesus. And rub that into your body where you have needs. Into your liver, into your pancreas, into your bloodstream, into your feet, into your baby toe, into your baby finger, into your hair. Whatever you need, eyes, ears. I want you to speak to them and say, you will be healed now in the name of Jesus by the anointing that breaks every yoke. Now then, check yourself. I want you to do what used to hurt. I want you to check what you couldn't move very well. I want you to examine yourself and move and twist and turn and do what used to hurt you. And if you realize something has just shifted and you, and it's maybe not 100%, but we're getting somewhere, I want you to wave excitedly all over this room. And if you're waving excitedly, get out of your seat and run down here real quickly right now because we want to finish you off. In Jesus' name, just let me have someone on, on both sides of the steps. Come on around here, my dear. Come on. <laughs> it's the muscles that did hurt so much and that is going away because I'm on cortisone. Cortisone. And uh, I, c I could I couldn't move like this. I couldn't move like this. I couldn't move like this. And I do it now. Look. Bring her up here, guys. Bring her up. Come on. Walk up the stairs. If something's yeah. happening to you, come on. Just quick. Come on. Come on. Come on. I need a couple of guys up here to catch, if you would, Steve. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Where are you from again? Quebec. Uh, South Shore of Montreal. Does it feel good? I want you to look at her face. <laughs> you see, healing is a paradigm shift. We go from pain to no pain. We go from earth to glory. It's amazing. Fire on you right here. John, there's another one here. Come on. That had severe neck pain and knee pain, and it's totally gone. It's totally gone. It's totally gone. How long have you had it? Years. How many? About two, my neck, and off and on with my knees, and it's gone. I, this was as far as I used to be able to turn my neck. Now I can, and I feel nothing. Just. See, it's, it's heaven come down on you, isn't it? Fire on her here, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Stretch your hands toward and say, get her, God. Fire on you here. What happened here, David? I'm not sure. Oh, um, about 10 years ago, I was scuba diving with my son, and I could only put my arm up about halfway, or, but now I can put my hand 
up, I mean, significantly more than I could when we started. How far could you move it normally before? Um, like, okay. Like, show me. What okay, a normal, normally my left arm, I can do this. This arm, I could only do this, but now I could get it up higher. Yeah, right up. Yeah. What happened, Carol? Here's your floaters. They're gone. They're gone. No floaters. How long have you had them? For about five years, only they've been getting worse and worse. Worse and worse. And, and the doctor said there's nothing you can do about it. But, but the, you know somebody who's an eye specialist. My Jesus did it. <laughs> Let the glory come heavily upon her right now. In your name. Amen. Arthritis that feels a lot better. Where was your arthritis, sweetie? It's been uh, through my legs, up here in my hips, lower back and shoulders, and it's just come um, in the last two months. In the morning without painkillers, I can't move. And uh, like it, so I'm very, very stiff. When I was standing out there, uh, it was a huge shift. It's not all gone, but I can move so much better. How much better do you think it is? Oh, it feels at least 50% better. Who did you have to forget? Just curious. I just named everybody I could think of. Good for you. And just say this with me. Lord, anyone else I forgot? Lord, is there anybody else that I forgot? Because if there is, I forgive them. Stretch your hands and let's believe for her, can we? Every trace of arthritis goes Everything of rejection, everything of every spirit of rejection coming out of her right ear. And we tell her immune system to come into agreement with the joints and the cartilage in her body. Every bit of pain goes. Check it again for me. 70. Keep going, Holy Spirit. What's happened here, Carol? An injury a year ago. Somebody fell on her here, I'll let her tell. At the healing conference a year ago, a person larger than me fell on me and injured my knee, and it hasn't been the same. But after um, tonight, I can squat down and I can do the stairs. I couldn't do that when I walked in today. And it was after you forgave them, right? I had, I had to forgive that person for falling on me. You know, it doesn't seem right that you should get injured in a healing conference, does it? Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making it up to her and giving her a wonderful paradigm shift here tonight. Look at all these people, Carol. We've got them all. You know, I don't know if we're going to have time for everybody. This is amazing. This is amazing, amazing, amazing. What have you got here, David? So lower back was painful and it feels a lot better now and all pain is gone. How long have you had lower back? Years. And now it's, it's almost gone. I think it is gone. It is gone. Right this minute it is. Just, just check it. Bend over. Do what you couldn't do. You have breathing problems. No, no. You do have them right now. Yeah. Your back's good, but now the breathing. How many believe God wants to take that too? See, because it's the will of God to heal him. We had a guy the other, a, a month or so ago, he was 78 years old. He, he got polio when he was three and he was in pain ever since and he could not lift his hands above the ear for all that time. And the Lord totally healed him and he was just so thrilled that his pain went and he could get out of bed himself without help because he could use his arms now. So I mean, yeah, the Lord will heal you. It doesn't matter what age you are. There's no pain in my back. Fire on these lungs. Loose him. Let him go. Take a deep breath for me. Let me know how that is. Are we getting anywhere? Yes. What's that feel like? It feels like I'm going to be able to breathe again. <laughs> I, 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 I am breathing better. You are? I am. 
And, and you're going to hang on to it. Yes, I want it. See, when you put your faith in the anointing, you take the anointing with you. If the enemy tries to come back and take it away, you're like, no, Jesus gave this to me and I'm keeping it. And you just step back into that anointing right there. Fire on him here. What happened with you? I, um, about the end of August, I uh, woke up with a large lump and a bruise on my chin. And uh, I was a little concerned, didn't know how it happened. And uh, worried about it a few days and the Lord told me it was a hematoma. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. I guess it'll go away. I don't have to worry, he told me. And then he told me what to do about it. Um, uh, hot compresses, and that helped. But it, it takes about three months to go away, but it was going away much faster. But today it was kind of bothering me inside my mouth, and, and I could feel it here. And so when we started praying and I reached down, it is like I got to press it really hard to feel anything. It's like 99% gone, so praise the Lord. 100%, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' name. What have you got, Carol? Uh, this lady came up and she said she got, she started last night with heat going up from her uh, back right up to her spine. And then tonight she was almost, uh, what, how much percent you? I would say about 50%. And as you were talking, we were just praying some more and? Total. <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing is, we're not quite as good as, at this as Jesus was just yet. So wow. it may take you 10 or 15 minutes to get a person through. That's okay, because there's a lot of us, right? Whoa. Fill her up. Fill her up. Where's Nancy Majera? Is she not here? There she is. Come here, Nancy. She told me like she's been really sick and terrible things. I, I, I wasn't even aware of it. We had heard that, you know, she was in a little bit of trouble, but then we didn't hear anymore. It's because she basically blacked out. Something wonderful happened to her last night after Duncan's talk. While she's standing in great pain on the prayer lines, waiting and waiting forever for the ministry team to get to her, what happened? Well, a couple of months ago, I had uh, three strokes. And the reason for the strokes was there was a tumor the size of my fist on my heart. And uh, so I had to have open heart surgery, have the tumor removed, and a lot of complications. And um, I'm completely healed and have zero neurological deficit, but I was in a lot of pain when I um, got here and very traumatized from everything. So I was waiting for the prayer team and um, my pain just went from like a seven or eight to a zero and it's been zero since, so. And I can lift my arms. You couldn't do that. Swing them around. What's your husband going to say? Oh, he'll love it. He'll love it. He'll get his wife back again. Holy Spirit, just come and fill her up <clears throat> with your fiery, fiery presence. What's happening, Carol? She had um, heel pain for six months and? And it's healed. It's gone. No pain. <laughs> heel pain, you said. <laughs> heel pain. Heel pain. Fill her up, Jesus. Whoa! Let's all stand, shall we? One of my favorite verses is John chapter 14, verse 12, where Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the works that I do, you will do. Now it goes on, but let's just stop right there. What did Jesus do? What's your favorite miracle? Don't say water into wine. <laughs> Healed the lepers. <laughs> Healed the cripples. Opened the eyes of the blind. Raised the dead. Walked on water. Had instant translocation. I mean, 
calmed the storm, fed the multitude. Truly, truly, I say to you, the works that I do, you will do, you will do at home watching because I go to the Father. I want you to believe that God can use, like Randy says, little old you. Hold your hands up to him. So Lord, I give my heart, my hands to you, my mouth to you. I want you to use me as a unstoppable healer and bringer of the kingdom of love and power. Now a little prayer we use around here just to get people going. It's, it's well written in Steve Long's book on healing. And it goes like this. Do you have pain in your body? Yes, I do. Say this after me. This healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done. I receive my healing now in the name of Jesus. Okay, now I want you to get with one other person and just in two or three words, tell each other what you want a miracle for. I don't want a 10 minute dialogue or a whole session or whatever, just take 15 seconds and find out what each one needs. My head, my stomach, my back, my feet, my knees, my eyes, my ears, whatever it is. Okay, look up here. Shh, look up here, everybody. You, you, you have all you need to know. If you talk too much, it'll unravel your faith. Tell the person with you, hey, this, you're, you're really fortunate today because I'm here with the anointing armed and dangerous. Now just decide who's gonna go first. Pick one of you. You're gonna go, one will go and then the other will go, but here, are you ready? Tell them, repeat this after me. This healing belongs to me. Because of what Jesus has done. At the whipping and at the cross. I receive my healing now as a free gift of his love. Now breathe it in. Breathe in the breath of God. Like we've been singing, blow mighty breath of God, move on this place. And let that anointing go in. Now speak to the problem and tell it Go from my new friend right now in Jesus' mighty name. Go from my new friend right now in Jesus' mighty name. All right. Now then, change partners. And ask your friend, your new friend, what do you need from the Lord tonight? Come on, let's just do this. You tell them. Right. Say this after me. Are you ready? This healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done. I receive my healing now as a free gift of his love. Breathe it in. Check yourself and begin to do what you could not do a moment ago. Now, I want you to check yourself. And if you feel like we're getting somewhere, but hey, that was my wife prayed, my friend prayed, my, this person I don't even know prayed. I want you to wave excitingly if something good just happened to you right here. Wave your hands excitedly. Come on, if you're waving, 
Do one more thing for me. Step into the nearest aisle and come quickly down to the front right here. Come on. Come, come, come. Come tell me. What happened, my dear? Well, we're praying together and um, I have chronic pain. And this afternoon when Patricia was speaking, I could feel something going on, but when we were, I was repeating it back, and I shouted out, chronic pain be gone! And I started moving my neck, and I can move it further, further and further without any pain. And I'm stomping my foot, and my arch has fallen, and I wear a foot brace, and I was limping coming in because it hurt, but it is gone. <laughs> Fire on her here. Thank you, Lord. Are you coming, my dear? What's just happened? Uh, well, I, I have, um, I had blood behind my eye. I, the spot that's here appears to be smaller. Now, I, I have peripheral vision, and it's like the spot that's blocked is smaller. I'm hearing better out of this ear, and my right knee is very little pain. Fire on her here. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lady here in the pink, are you coming forward? Come on. Don't be frightened, honey. Come on. Yeah, yeah. What's happening to you? Uh, I popped a rib head out of place um, a couple months ago, and I had a chiropractor got it back in. And pulling my suitcase out, when I got from the airport, I did the same thing, and it's been going up and down through the whole conference and had prayer. It gets better, and then it gets worse. And um, The person beside me had a word about my daughter to let her go that she's walked away from the Lord and uh, my heart is so heavy and she's like, trust her to the Lord and the pain's gone down. Pain gone. How much, how much of it is gone? Probably 50%. 50. You know what 50% tells you? He's, He's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it. We're halfway there. 60, 70, 80, Father. 90, 100, Father. Take it all, all of it, all that shock and trauma injury goes out of her in Jesus' mighty name. Check it again. What do you think? 40% left. That's good, isn't it? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Just. Keep, carry on there a minute, Carol. What have you got? Yeah. What's happened to you, honey? Um, it's not me, it's my dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of your staff members asked her to pray for her eyes, and my eyesight just got better. <laughs> So she wanted me to come testify. So your eyesight just got better. What was wrong with it? Uh, stigmatism. Um, you have glasses that you wear? Yeah, um, no, I, I should, but I don't have a. I do have a prescription, but I've never filled them out, and I don't think I'm going to need to now. <laughs> Fire on him, Lord, and this family. I ask you to bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. Wow! 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 People, you know what? Uh, the Holy Spirit would continue to do this all night long if we would just stay with him and, and keep going. It's such a wonderful thing. <sighs> Lift your face and say to him, Lord, I love the kingdom. I absolutely love the kingdom. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Well, see, healing is one of those things that's a paradigm shift. And when we experience a healing, it changes our whole view of things. Our worldview just opens up. It's like God just came on the scene. Everything's changed right here. Salvation is the, is the very same way. It's like that. What happened to you? 
Jean-Marc. I have a Parkinson's disease, and uh, this afternoon a lady prayed for me. And um, since a couple months, I'm uh, trembling more and more, even if I take medication. Yeah. And uh, since she prayed for me this afternoon, she said, no more trembling. I feel a lot more better. Je wow. And uh, I, I can I can tell you I'm ill 100%, yes. but I, I have faith I'm going to have. I'm gonna be ill. No more trembling, he says. Parkinson's disease, he's doing a lot better. Wouldn't it be great if you both went home to Montreal healed? Yes. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Now, like I said, healing is one of those things that tells us that God is here and it changes the way we see things. It may be that some of you are here and you have, for whatever reason, you are not at the moment fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? People get hurt, they get discouraged, they back away and the next thing you know, you're backslidden Stuff like that goes on. Listen to me. If you're here tonight and you are not right with God, I beg of you, get right with him tonight. So why do you say that? It's too dangerous. You don't have any guarantee that you'll ever see another sunrise. You, we, we, we hang by a very thin silver thread, right? But see, a lot of times we think, well, I'm not good enough for God. I've been too bad or I missed my chance or this or that. People have all kinds of excuses and the enemy lies to them and then we, we agree with his reasoning. I want you to realize Jesus Christ came to rescue you from a Christless eternity. All you have to do is humble yourself, admit that you were wrong, and tell him, Lord, I'm coming home. Now let's all stand together for this. Can we do that? And then we're gonna go to the, the prayer lines and, uh, and get part three, more of the Holy Spirit. But just before we do that, I want you to talk to yourself. And, and just say, Lord, am I rightly related to you? Have I fallen away? Have I gotten entrapped with pornography or sin or this or that? Have I drifted away from my love affair with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? And if so, I'm coming home tonight. Now see, you need to admit it to yourself. I need Jesus. I need a savior in my heart. And you know, he, he only came for, for sinners really, for people who need a savior. If you don't think that's you, well then okay. But if, you're, if, you, if you qualify and you wanna come back home to the Lord tonight, or perhaps you wanna give your heart to him for the very first time, and some of you watching on video at home on the on the live stream you maybe need to make this decision and if you do we'd love to hear from you with a text or an email but i want you to admit it to yourself first of all i need what john's talking about right now get honest with yourself and admit it to yourself because see that's where it begins with you and i getting honest with god he sees right through all our con games and all our pretense and all of that. And when we start to get real and honest, now we're getting down to it, yeah? Just admit it to yourself. Lord, I got hurt, I got scared, I got angry, I went away, I fought you, I, I didn't want to give in, I thought Christianity was no fun, whatever it was, but tonight, I know that I need a savior. If that's you, admit it to yourself. Okay, now if you just admitted that to yourself, I want you to take another bold step and hold your hand up high and say, I just told Jesus 
that I needed him to come back into my heart. Unashamedly, hold your hand up high, say, I need him. God bless you all over the room. Right. Now, if you're serious about this, and I'm sure you are because he's very serious, I want you to do one more thing for me. Come out of your seats and gather around right here at the front because Carol and I want to pray with you. And you're going to have one of those paradigm shifts that I'm talking about. You're going to go from nothing to everything. And your name will be written in the book of life. So come on, quickly. If you raise your hand and said, I'm coming back, I'm coming home, just get down here as quick as you can. And maybe some of you nearby, you, you might want to do like my grandfather did to me and just say, hey, if you're not sure, maybe you better come, maybe you better go. And you say, if you're afraid, I'll come with you, but come on, everybody, just come, just come, just come. No more games. In Jesus' mighty name. Let's all say this together. You guys, you say it as a prayer of remembrance. But, the, but you at the front, I want you to say this and mean it with all of your heart. Will you do that for me? We're gonna just pray a little prayer that said, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Will you come into my life? I want you as my savior and my Lord. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, I am so sorry that I have turned away from you for whatever reason, but I'm coming home tonight. I'm giving my life to you. Come into my heart right now and wash me clean from all of my sins. From tonight on, I'm a Christian. From tonight on, you are mine and I am yours. Help me to forgive everyone who's hurt me. And help me to fall in love with you. And that's your assignment, friends. Nothing to do except believe that it's all being done. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank you for every one of them here. I thank you for everyone. Fire upon them here in Jesus' mighty name. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Filled in your mighty name. Filled in your mighty, mighty name. Let your glory come. Let it come. Let it come. Fire on you. Holy Spirit, give them that divine paradigm shift, that encounter with God that'll change them forever. Fire on him here. Fire on you. Let it come, Lord God. Let it come, Lord God. Bless them. Bless him. Bless him. Oh. Bless her. Heal that arm in the name of Jesus. Now listen, friends, those of you that came forward, I want you to be encouraged. You've just made perhaps the most important decision of your life, all right? And Ruth Ann is here with Pastor Steve. Can you just turn this way and go take a minute in the cafe with her? Just go ahead in the cafe and just talk a little bit about it and just get a revelation of what has just happened to you. All right, let's give them a great hand and uh, say well done, everybody.
How many would like to be freshly filled with the Holy Spirit? <sighs> That's number three, Holy Spirit encounters. Our friend Melinda Fish, she said it this way, there are no toxic levels of the Holy Spirit. That means you can have all you want of him and it'll do you nothing but good, right? 